I want to start where we usually finish, which is to acknowledge the many, many people that have gone into the work that I'm about to talk about with you in a number of important ways. My mentors, including Carol and others, my colleagues, my friends, people that have given me some money to do this, that it, with which I can pay other students to do this. Um, and it's been an incredibly rich and rewarding experience to work with people across disciplines um, and learn from them and take their knowledge and my interests and see what we can do with it. So I just want to start by putting down a marker that what I'm about to talk about is, is by no means done in isolation and without the input of lots and lots of wonderful, intelligent people. As many of you may know, 2016 is the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's mm. death. There are some disagreements about when exactly he was born, but we know pretty well when he died which was April 23rd, 1616. So here we are in 2016. There have been phenomenal celebrations of Shakespeare going on around the globe this year. And I have been a fan of Shakespeare forever. I am the child of an English professor who exposed me to Shakespeare early on, relentlessly. Um, and so I, I have, I've been a big fan, but I'm going to start by uh, basically taking issue with Shakespeare's views of aging. So what you see up here on the screen is an excerpt of his famous All, All the World's Stage soliloquy from the play As You Like It. Um, most people know the opening lines, but I don't know how many people know that it goes on to present a life course. And so Shakespeare sets him up as one of the earliest life, life course stage theorists, <laughs> of courting the entire, outlining the entire life course as a sequence of seven stages. So this is also known as the seven ages of man speech. Um, the first ages begin with a description of babyhood and then toddlerhood, but then we get on and we get to what he calls the sixth age, which is the beginning of decline. So sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloons. We get a, the image of somebody in sort of comfortable clothing with spectacles on nose, right, failing eyesight, pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank. So, withering, right? You can't, not fitting into your clothes anymore. And his big manly voice turning again toward the childish trouble, pipes and whistles in his sound, the description of the failing voice, the, the, losing the, the low resonance, turning into a higher pitch, squeaky type of sound. And then finally, the last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness. So this often quoted, quoted view of, of old age as a return to childishness, particularly in terms of inability to do things and dependency on other people. Um, and this is quite bleak. Mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. So even before we die, we basically have absolutely no quality of life. I want to take issue with this and suggest that the, the picture may not be quite so bleak. And I think you know, a lot of what we're seeing today uh, will, will speak to that as well. Shakespeare, there, there are a lot of ways in which uh, less than flattering portrayals of age appear in lots and lots of different plays. That was from As You Like It, but for those of you that have been out to APT and seen some of these plays, you know that older people tend to show up pretty poorly in Shakespeare's estimation. So King Lear, for example, is said in his own dialogue, I'm a very foolish, fond old man. I fear I am not in my perfect mind. He's well aware of his own failings. I'm too old to learn. In Henry IV, part one, we see when sapless age, weak, unable limbs, drooping, this image of, of, of sagging and decline, in Much Ado About Nothing, when age is in, the wit is out. From the tempest, as with age, his body uglier grows, and so his mind cankers. So the body gets ugly and the mind goes with it. Um, and then the sort of poignant sonnet 73, that time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves, or none, or few, do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold. This image of aging and dying. So this is a pretty common type of, of portrayal of age in Shakespearean writing. I want to cut Shakespeare a little bit of a break because his context 400 years ago is very, very different than the context that we are currently living in. 
So As You Like It was written in 1599. That was the Seven Ages of Man speech, which ends without anything, sans everything. Um, at that time in history, life expectancy was about age 35. There were not many older people walking around in the, in the streets of London at that time. So those who were walking around were probably pretty sick. Shakespeare himself died just before the age of 52, we believe. And in, in his regular daily routine, he would come across things like the plague, like smallpox, like syphilis, typhus, malaria. These are kinds of things that people would be getting sick from and dying very quickly from. In addition, there was lousy public sanitation. A lot of what we owe our extended mortality, excuse me, our extended life expectancy to has to do with improvements in public health and public sanitation. And back in Elizabethan days, public sanitation was very poor. And if you did get sick, there were many treatments to deal with it. So he was living in a world where people would get sick and die pretty regularly. And those that live, were able to live on had probably been sick enough that their, their physiology, their health was impaired, and once, once they got to older ages, they looked like the kinds of people that he describes in his plays. Not healthy, not hardy, not very physically capable. So just to emphasize this point, this is, if you were to look around Elizabethan London, um, what I'm showing you here, the percent of people that are still alive by age. So by the time you get out to late 30s, early 40s, you're down to about 10% of the people left. Lo very, very high levels of mortality very, very early in life. So the likelihood of getting out to your 60s, late 60s, early 70s was almost nil. Compare that to today. We're doing a lot better. We have improvements in, in public sanitation, improvements in medical care, and so we're living a lot longer. And so we know that one of the, the trends right now is that a rapid expansion of the aging population, those 65 and older, and even more in terms of, of percentage growth, those 85 and older. Um, and so we are seeing a massive expansion of the older population. As we walk around the streets of our cities, we are more and more likely to see older adults, which is very different from what Shakespeare saw. And they're more likely to be healthy. This just emphasizes what um, Barb Bowers was talking about earlier, that we are getting healthier as we, as we get older and as, as we uh, move on as a society. So these are uh, trends in mortality over time from 1970 to present day, and you can see declines in mortality rates. The three lines, so blue is, is men and women, the dark uh, points are men, and the, the brown ones are women. But overall, we see this, this secular decline in mortality, so we're living longer and we're becoming less disabled. We are more and more likely to live to later ages with high levels of high degrees of functioning. Again, very different than what Shakespeare would have seen. So not only are we living longer, but we're living better. And our, our rates of, of functional impairment are going down. Slight uptick recently. We are gonna be interested to see how various other changes in society, like the increasing obesity patterns are gonna play out in terms of disability and so on. But the news over the past 30 years has been good in terms of functional impairment. In spite of all that, we still think of old age the way Shakespeare did. <laughs> this is a word cloud. You could, do, you could generate these from anywhere, really. How many, how many uh, go on the internet and ask for a reading of Facebook or Google or what have you, and you get a word cloud of words that are used very, very commonly um, and the larger the word, the more frequently the, that word is used. So we are living in a time of improving health, extension of the life course, improving functional abilities, but the vision that our culture has of old age is still quite negative. Things like slow, forgetful, lonely, poor, frail, all of these negative ideas. There are positive things in here too, but the sizes of, of those words are much, much smaller. So our vision, our vision of age is not keeping up with what's actually happening in terms of quality of life. And so that's what I want to address today. And I think this is a little bit of preaching to the choir. I think you probably already believe this, but I'm going to try to prove it to you anyway. I want to make three relatively simple points. One is that there are, in general, older adults report being happier than at any other time in their lives. It's what's known as the paradox of aging. So compared to themselves earlier and compared to younger people right now, older adults, people in their 60s and 70s, report generally being happier than at any other point in their lives and then, and then better, more happier than people at other ages younger than that. 
There's a little nuance to this, and I want to talk about that a little bit. The second point I want to make is that kind of stuff matters. The extent to which you feel happy, the extent to which you feel engaged, that your life has purpose, meaning, that you have satisfying social relationships in your life, that matters not just to your mental well-being and your feeling like your life is, has a good quality, but also to your physical health, to measures of your biological functioning, how long you're going to live, the extent to which you're likely to become disabled over time. This stuff really does matter. And then finally, you know, that's all very well and good, but what, what good does it do me if I can't do anything about it? Um, I want to suggest to you that this is something that we can, that is modifiable, and that's something that Carol alluded to. She and I have been working on an intervention to improve psychological well-being in older adults, but that's not the only thing that's going on that I think could, could speak to that. So, in order to do this, I want to talk about work that we and others have been doing using a survey that, that Carol just referred to, the Survey of Midlife Development in the United States, or MIDAS. Um, it is now a three-wave longitudinal study begun in the mid-90s, and the third wave just came out of the field last year. Data collection has involved a lots and lots of different kinds of modes, but the, mostly what I'm going to be talking about are data that were collected over the telephone and with paper and pencil questionnaires, and also some data that came from a sample of people that went into the laboratory for an overnight stay and were poked and prodded and we got all kinds of wonderful biological measures on them. So I will highlight these as, as we go. But these are the data that I'm going to be showing you for the most part. So these are from Midas. Now, there's no denying that as we age, we are more likely to get sick and we are more likely to become disabled. So the percent of people who report having at least one, if not more, chronic condition, things like hypertension, arthritis, heart disease, cancer, increases with age fairly linearly from in mid-40s on up to mid-60s. So we get a pretty not surprising increase in the number of chronic conditions that people report. At the same time, people are increasing in the extent to which they have some functional impairments, some difficulties doing things in their lives, like climbing a flight of stairs, grocery shopping, um, getting to the bathroom, dressing themselves, and so on. So the percent of people with some limitation, oddly enough, around age 30, it's not zero. There are some people that are younger that do report some kind of functional impairments, but as we get older, the, the percentage of people that have um, some form of limitation um, increases to around 40-50%. People are aware of this. So as people get older, they are aware that their own health is declining and they report this. So if you ask people on average, how is your health physically, how is your health mentally, they show that there is, there's been, there is some drop off as people go along. So people in their 30s rate their health very highly, people in their 60s rate their, their health a little lower, and there's a fairly linear decline over time um, or across ages, both in physical health on the left and mental health on the right, although mental health is fairly stable. What's interesting is that they think they're doing better than the people around them. <laughs> the Lake Wobegon effect, right? So one of the ways in which we keep ourselves happy over time is that we compare ourselves to people that are doing worse than we are. <laughs> So when you ask people, compared to people of your age, how do you think you're doing? Most people in, this, in the MIDAS study anyway think, I'm doing a lot better. I recognize my health isn't what it used to be, but I think I'm doing a lot better than the other people of, of, that I think of of my age. So people are actually thinking, you know, I'm, I can see declines, I'm not doing as well as I used to be, but overall I think I'm doing pretty well. And that actually becomes a very interesting phenomenon, an interesting thing. So, if you ask older adults, even in the context of having chronic illnesses, of having functional impairments, if you ask them if they think they are aging successfully, however they want to define the word successfully, most say they are. And these are people with demonstrable health issues and functional issues, but they still think of themselves as aging successfully, doing a really good job of getting older. So the question is, how, what, are they, what are they looking to to make that kind of an assessment? And there's been a lot of work on this, but one of the studies that I've always found really compelling was done about six years ago. Jennifer Reichstadt took 60 people, excuse me, 22 people over 60 living in San Diego. You gotta be doing great just living in San Diego, period. <laughs> um, what she, she did these intensive interviews with them to get a sense of what they think of as, as criteria for aging successfully. Um, you know, what do you think is important in, if you, in the process of aging successfully? 
And across all of the various responses and to various different questions, she found some cer certain common themes that came out. And this has been replicated in other kinds of research as well. Um, one is a positive attitude. So what we would, what we, what in the research community, what would be called positive affect, the idea that you, you have this positive orientation toward, toward the world. Um, so things like, you don't say, oh, what was me, and I can't do that because I have this. If, you, if you're aging successfully, that attitude doesn't exist. Or a, a delightful example, my uncle was a potato farmer, sometimes his crop would fail, he would just get up and do it again. You know, you stick to itiveness, this kind of positive outlook, optimism. Also, a fairly forgiving relationship with yourself and your own life experiences. You gotta realize that you are not in your 30s anymore and you actually say, it's okay, it's all right, I'm, I'm not in my 30s, but I can still do things. And you modify what you do. You may not run a marathon, but maybe you can manage a 5K. Um, you suit your desires to what's realistic. So you adjust your life so that you can continue to do the things that matter to you and you, you accept the fact that you have limitations. Infusing your life with a sense of purpose and growth. Um, don't just feel because I've, I just don't feel because I've done all this with my life, that's all I can do. Keep trying things. You know, I'm not done. There are still things that I want to do. Do things you really want to do. Do things that have personal meaning. Even if you've got money and you love to take cruises, for God's sake, take cruises. <laughs> do the things that you enjoy. Do the things that matter to you. And then finally, and this shows up in virtually every study of, of this kind, is the importance, the centrality of social relationships. You know, not surprisingly, we are a social species and as we age, social relationships are particularly important. Every social interaction I have is always a learning process. So there's a combination, not just social, but also an intellectual stimulation too. There are so many people who have had experiences that I can glean from. Keep your old friends, make some new ones, don't isolate yourself. So again, these, when, what pe when people are asked, what do you consider successful aging? These are the kinds of things they volunteer. So bear these in mind. Things like positive attitude, self-acceptance, a sense of purpose and growth, and the centrality of, of satisfying meaningful personal relationships. What I want to do now is just to introduce the concept of psychological well-being and generally the two um, flavors of psychological well-being that researchers typically talk about, hedonic and eudaimonic. So hedonic well-being is the idea that uh, you, your life has more positive stuff in it than it has negative stuff in it. It, it derives from having a greater abundance of positive emotions, fewer negative emotions. If you measure this, you ask people generally, how happy have you been over the course of the last week or so? Um, give them a bunch of, of questions about happiness, joy, calmness, and negative things like sadness, um, irritation. And that aggregates up into a sort of balance between positive stuff and negative stuff. In addition, people are asked simple questions like, overall, how satisfied are, with you, are, are you with your life? This is the idea of hedonic well-being. It has to do with feeling good, generally feeling good. The other tradition, oh, excuse me, before I do that, um, what we see with hedonic well-being, these measures of feeling good more often than you feel bad, and this is what I referred to earlier as the paradox of aging. You tend to see an increase across the life course until the very end, until you know, within the last month or two of life, then you see a, a pretty steep drop off. Um, but right out until till the later reaches of, of aging, in the 70s, 80s, even 90s, you see this increase in people's ratings of how, how positive their lives are, how, positive, how positively they feel. All the while with accumulating health problems, accumulating disability, and so on. This tends to be a very, very stable finding. The second type, and I don't mean to suggest that these are in any way in conflict with each other or opposites of each other, they're complementary, um, but they're slightly, they're valenced slightly differently. Eudaimonic well-being is less about feeling good and more about this idea of being engaged in meaningful pursuits in your life. Um, so deep engagement in, in pursuits that are meaningful for you, that have value, that have substance. Um, these have been operationalized, that is measured in a bunch of different ways, but one of the leading scales is Carol's own scales of psychological well-being. And I pulled out four, there, there's six subscales, but I pulled out four of them. And these should look awfully familiar, right? Personal growth, and here's one of the items. For me, life has been a continuous process of learning, changing, and growth. Purpose in life, I enjoy making plans for the future and working to make them a reality. Positive social relations, Pe most people see me as loving and affectionate. And then finally, self-acceptance. When I look at the story of my life, I'm pleased with how things have turned out. 
These should look a lot like what people nominate voluntarily as keys to successful aging. So these map on pretty well to what people think of as being important components of aging successfully. With eudaimonic well-being, though, the picture is a little bit more complex when it comes to how these things change over time. So one thing, I think one way to think about this is that it is, to some extent, what Shakespeare would have seen, that a sense of personal growth, being able to, to continue to grow as a human being, declines across ages. Another one that takes a pretty steep decline is a sense of your life having purpose and meaning. These are the bad news stories. But within this context of eudaimonic well-being, there are other aspects of eudaimonic well-being that are either stable or actually show improvements over time. So this one is autonomy, which is a sense of you marching to the, your own drummer, basically. Um, social relationships, this gold line is pretty stable. Self-acceptance, too, is sort of also pretty stable over time. So it's a more complicated picture, which I think is two, I mean, there are two stories here. One is that you see very steep declines in some aspects of eudaimonic well-being, like, like a sense of purpose. And sadly, that is one of the, the measures that has shown sort of key linkages to health outcomes. So this is, on the one hand, this is a picture of, of a pessimistic outlook for what, what can happen with age. On the other hand, it gives us a sense of where we might be able to do something, where we might be able to intervene. To, to boost people's ability to have a sense of purpose in their lives. So keep that in mind as well. well I'll, I'll come back to that one later. So that's what I mean by nuances. In the cases of, of feeling good, positive outlook on life and so on, that tends to increase over time with age, um, only dropping off when we get very close to death. Um, but with eudaimonic well-being, these subdomains show different kinds of aging profiles, that people's sense of being involved in satisfying social relationships is fairly stable, but having a sense that your life has purpose and meaning tends to take a pretty steep decline. So it depends what we're talking about. The next thing I want to try to persuade you of is that these things matter for health. I'll start with some definitions. The World Health Organization, when they defined health, made a very interesting, uh, volunteered a very interesting definition that state, that the health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This was a while ago. This was the 1940s. But we still tend to think of health as being the absence of disease and, and restoring health being the treatment of disease. We don't tend to think of it, this continuum, this other continuum, as the presence of well-being. But what I want to suggest to you is that the presence of well-being and gradations in well-being, even in the absence of, of disease or mental illness, are important for health. And then um, I think Barb quoted Rosalind Carter. I'm going to bring Jimmy into the picture here. Um, in his book, The Virtues of Aging, he asked the question, what is good health? And he concluded that it is more than being able-bodied. It involves things like self-acceptance, self-regard, control over our own, our own affairs, strong ties with other people, and a purpose in life. Again, these are the same kinds of things that people volunteer. These are the kinds of things that eudaimonic well-being measures are designed to assess. The key point, and here, here's where I'm going with this, obviously, the key point is that physical and mental activities strengthen each other. All right. So I want to show you two sets of evidence, basically. This is what, you know, as a researcher, I want to show me the evidence, show me how, how the, prove what you're trying to say. So I want to show you two flavors of evidence. One is that well-being is protective, that in the context of a variety of age-related diseases and mortality, even having high levels of well-being can be protective against bad outcomes. The second is buffering effects. And this is actually very similar to what Julie, Julie's work is, is looking at, is that in the context of challenges, having high levels of well-being may, be, may buffer against the adverse impact of a challenge. So in, on the one hand, it's protective just generally. On the other hand, it may be a resource you can call upon to help mitigate the impact of, of negative events. So first of all, protective. Um, there is a large and growing literature suggesting that psychological well-being in, in all of its forms, your attitude, the extent to which you use positive adjectives to describe your life, the extent to which you feel your life has purpose and meaning, um, these are associated with living longer. So one very famous study, the Nun study, um, looked at nuns as they were entering 
into convents at the at very young ages, early 20s, and then followed them right out onto the moment of their deaths. Um, they looked at, at all kinds of things with them, and they, they got their brains to look at the, uh, what their brains were doing. They did cognitive testing, but what they found was that the kinds of words they used when they were entering the convent in the early 20s predicted the extent, the, the length of their lives later on. And the, the more they used positive emotions in describing their own lives, the longer they lived. Um, the Alameda County study, famous study of about 7,000 people. Again, greater well-being predicted reduced mortality over a very long period, 28 years. And interestingly enough, the differences in negative feelings like depression, um, sadness, and so on did not affect mortality. Positive feelings did. In, a, in the Midas study, um, Nick Turiano has been doing a lot of important work on this, showing that greater purpose in life is, is associated with increased longevity. And what's interesting about Nick's work is that he's showing that this relationship is true right across the lifespan. It's not merely true for older adults, it's true through the entire sample, which starts around age 25. As we move forward, the likelihood of dying is greater with lower levels of the sense of purpose. Um, one of the th ways in which we can bring a lot of studies together into one place is to do a, a big review. This was done back in 2009, and the conclusion, looking at a bunch of different studies that looked at well-being and mortality, um, suggested that overall the conclusion is that purpose in life and, and well-being is important for longer life. And then finally, you may think that this is just a, that both purpose in life and, and higher well-being and longer life are merely markers for some biological strengths or genetic strengths. Maybe the people that have the genes to live longer also have happy genes. <laughs> you can rule that one out, at least on the basis of one pretty well done study published a few years ago that looked at a sample of 4,000 Danish twins who were 70 and older and showed that, that the genes uh, Differences in genetic makeup accounted for very little amount of the differences in mortality um, that it really was about, about well-being. So that whatever genetic influences might be there, it doesn't explain this relationship between well-being and greater longevity. Short of mortality, we can look at differences in health. So this is one of the variables that I work with, which is numbers of chronic conditions, people reporting how, how sick they are and how sick they become over time. So this is where MIDAS is particularly powerful. It's a longitudinal study. So we can look at people not just at a moment in time, but look at how they change over time. So what I'm showing you here are the changes in the numbers of chronic conditions that people report as they age. So as you get up, this is people that have added a single condition over time, two conditions over time, three conditions over time, and so on. Starting, and these are their starting ages. So on average, people that were 25 at the start of the study showed up 10 years later with maybe not quite a condition on average. But as you get older, the likelihood of adding conditions goes up. The good news is that it tails off. So as we get up into our 70s, we're not adding conditions, we're not, in the rate of adding conditions doesn't increase, but we're still adding conditions. But the three lines are showing you basically thirds of scores on psychological well-being. And that blue line, where people across every single age are adding more conditions than, at any other, than the other two lines, that's the bottom third in psychological well-being. So people that are lacking in high levels of psychological well-being, people with the lowest scores, are more likely to add conditions, to get sicker over time across all of these different ages. And as we have to do in these kinds of studies, we have to dismiss potential explanations like being depressed, being, having other, prop, other issues, racial differences, ec economic differences, and so on. We control for all of that. So this is really is a very sharp, sharp lens on differences in well-being as a, as a primary determinant of differences in, in getting sicker over time. Same thing with disability. Again, chopping up the psychological well-being scores into thirds, the people in the dark brown were those that scored highest on well-being, people in the lighter brown were in the middle, and the people in the gray bars were the lowest third. And as you can see, over time, the people that were more likely to increase in functional limitations, have more functional impairments over time, were more likely to fall into that bottom third on psychological well-being. Whereas the people in the top third, it was protective. So the, they were less likely to show up with, with worse functional impairments over time, adjusted for age, depression, all of the things that could potentially explain this. So it's protective. The second category of evidence I want to show you is that it's also a resource. Psychological well-being is also a resource upon which people can draw to mitigate the impact of negative influences. And I want to show you one thing 
Um, this is a paper that Carol and I published a few years ago. And this gets back to my roots as, a, as someone that was very interested in the immune system and processes that have to do with host defense and so on. What I'm showing you here are a couple of different markers of inflammation, IL-6 standing for interleukin-6, CRP standing for C-reactive protein. These are both markers of inflammation. Without belaboring the point, infl inflammation is implicated in a variety of age-related conditions, chronic diseases, and disability. And what this shows is that as you increase in the number of medical conditions that you report, things again like hypertension, heart disease, arthritis, doesn't matter what the condition is, but the more conditions you report, the higher your levels of these inflammatory proteins. Not surprisingly, the inflammation tends to track illness like this. But for those that report, and what I'm showing you here is, is the specific domain of purpose in life, and this is the light gray line, people that have higher levels of purpose in life that link between more chronic conditions and higher levels of inflammation is interrupted. It's weaker. So that there is some protective effect of, of having a high sense of purpose in life on the extent to which adding chronic conditions means higher levels of, inf of inflammation. And if you put it on a different scale, um, if you, once you get out to the, these fairly moderate range of, of chronic conditions, for, for aging adults anyway. These differences in IL-6 and CRP actually translate into differences in years of, of life. So the, the differences in levels of IL-6 are the kinds of things that you would see predicting um, uh, five years or so of aging. So these are not trivial differences. Um, and I wanna say we, we are actually just, we were, my colleagues and I have been working with other outcomes including mortality and disability and we see very similar pictures. Um, that in the context of chronic illness, people that have chronic conditions, having high levels of well-being buffers you against the risks of mortality and disability over time. So, where we are right now, um, hedonic well-being, that sort of feeling positive stuff more than negative stuff, tends to increase with age secularly, um, at least until nearing the end of life. Eudaimonic well-being is more nuanced, and again, purpose in life, this really important particular important domain of eudaimonic well-being shows very steep declines across age. Um, and unfortunately, this is one of the ones that's been most widely demonstrated to be protective against age-related declines in things like physical uh, well-being, in terms of mortality, but also in terms of mental illness and, and other things like that. So purpose in life is an important resource that older adults need to be able to draw on as they face increasing risk for health issues and mental illness issues. So, all very well and good, but it's only useful information if there is something that we can do to boost psychological well-being. And that's the third thing that I want to turn to now. I want to suggest that well-being is something that can be cultivated. This is not something that, is, that we are born with, and that's, that's the end of the story. So, we know from a, a number of studies that well-being is potentially modifiable. Um, these, this line of thinking derives from a set of studies that was done in Italy, um, in, in psych psychiatric circles. So, well-being therapy was developed by the Italian psychiatrist Giovanni Fava, working with the clinical psychologist um, Chiara Ruini, with whom Carol and I collaborate. And basically noticing that in people that are clinically depressed, there is, of course, the hallmark depressed mood. But one of the things that Giovanni Fava noticed is that in depre and, and, and depression, of course, is something that is notoriously difficult to stay out of. Even after you've been through successful therapy, most people will then relapse. And what he noticed is that you know, the treatments for depression were all about, about getting out of negative mood. But he noticed that people that were clinically depressed were also very quick to, to curtail their experiences of positive positive moods and pos enjoyment of positive experiences. And he surmised that maybe one component of a therapy could involve helping people extend their enjoyment, the savoring of positive experiences. And so he developed this, he and Chiara developed this idea of well-being therapy that targeted exactly that. That when something positive happens, savor it, enjoy it, notice it. And what he found was in studies of of uh, psychiatric patients, people that were clinically depressed, later on people that had general anxiety disorder, that after application of this well-being therapy, they took a lot longer to relapse and were much less likely to relapse over time than people that just had standard treatment. So this looked like a very powerful idea. So working with Chiara Ruini, um, we, we found that there was no similar kind of uh, 
program for older adults. And so we decided to develop one. And we started working on this a number of years ago uh, with support from a, a couple of entities at University of Wisconsin. So the program was based on, on uh, well-being therapy. It involves borrowing ideas from cognitive behavioral therapy that have to do with recognizing your thoughts about your experiences. But we specifically focused on these domains of eudaimonic well-being. So experiences of growth, purpose, having satisfying social relationships, and so on. And we adapted these to, for older adults using, again, well-established kinds of, of procedures, practices that were out there, including things like life review. So one of the ways in which you can, can do this kind of therapy is to have people move through their lives and notice positive experiences, record them, and, and savor them. In this case, a lot of the experiences that might be good, f good fodder for, for discussion and, and reminiscing and so on it, are in the past. And so thinking about positive experiences from the past and savoring those became something that we tried to work into the, the, uh, the program. We developed an eight-week program working very closely with community partners in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, these were delivered in community centers. Uh, they were based, the, the guts of the program were hour and a half group classes, about 12 to 15 people per group. But then we also asked them to keep daily diaries of some kind where they recorded their positive experiences and then would come in the next week and discuss them. Our initial sample, um, we just published a paper on this last year, um, was about a little over 100 people that lived in Kenosha County. The age range was between 59 and 97 with a mean of about 72, mostly female, not surprising given the demographic, um, about 40% married and fairly highly educated. And it was a, basically a pilot study, so the first thing we wanted to know is, would people show up? <laughs> if we offered this kind of thing, would they want it? Would they, would they show up for it? And I, I want to note one thing. This became actually an education for us in how you market to this community. <laughs> because apparently using things like, are you feeling low? <laughs> is not a good way to get people into an intervention like this. Um, so our, our brilliant partners in Kenosha came up with this idea of, of enjoy the journey, enjoy the journey, and came up with this, this logo of a balloon, and came up with the name for this program, which was Lighten Up, <laughs> and framing it in a more positive way, that is, you know, get more enjoyment out of your, out of your older days, that brought people in, that made people interested. Um, so that became a really interesting education in, in, in how to speak to, to at least this older community in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. So feasible, yes. People came. And we had a, a fairly high completion rate given all the things that can go wrong. Um, health issues, family issues, snow. <laughs> <laughs> We still had a more, better than 85% completion, which we defined as, as coming to um, at least a majority of the classes. And we saw improvement in multiple assessments. So I'll give you a quick walk through these. The main target was eudaimonic well-being. This was the objective. So through these classes, talking about positive experiences, educating them about different aspects of eudaimonic well-being, the goal was to boost eudaimonic well-being, boost a sense of purpose, boost a sense of growth, boost a sense of self-acceptance. <laughs> And across the board, that's pretty much what we saw. So we saw this, this nice increase in eudaimonic well-being. But then we saw a lot of other things that we did not expressly target. We saw a big drop in depression, reports of depressive symptoms. And this is not something that, that was part of the design of the program, but it was something that came out of it. And it was on the order of about 26%, which I hear from people that have tried to do interventions in older adults, is a fairly substantial decline. There were other things that we didn't target. So people reporting somatic symptoms, things like aches and pains, discomforts, those reports dropped. We asked some questions about quality of sleep, and we saw improvements in things like difficulty in falling asleep. Fewer people reported having trouble falling asleep after they went through five, six, seven, eight weeks of this intervention. Again, things that, that we never targeted, we just wanted to know if, the, if things changed, and, and indeed they did. So one of the conclusions or some of the perspectives on the program is that older adults will attend a well-being-based program, particularly in community settings, because there's some issues with, with reticence to go to clinical settings for things like this, to medical settings, so community settings like libraries, senior centers is where we did this, and that seemed to be agreeable. 
um, we saw significant improvements in virtually all of the things that we measured. We measured things about psychological well-being, about mood, about physical symptoms, as you saw, but also about sleep. Um, and, and we saw pretty much improvements across the board. But um, thanks to Chiara Rowini's brilliant idea, we also collected anecdotal evidence. So we asked open-ended questions at the end of the questionnaire. And we saw evidence for other, other evidence for impact. For example, um, one of the very first groups went through this eight weeks and liked each other so much that they didn't want to stop meeting. And so they have, I think to this day, this is like you know, now five, six years later, they continue to get together for lunch on a monthly basis because they, they just enjoyed each other's company so much. Um, we've, we've had a lot of requests for booster classes, like at the end of eight weeks, could I come back in a year and just do this again for maybe one or two sessions? Because I found it so helpful and I would really want to do this. Um, and then there were these wonderful open-ended questions that Kiara suggested we ask to get these kinds of data. So just to highlight some examples for you, I learned that most of my bad feelings about getting old are fixable by me. This is the whole cognitive behavioral therapy idea to recognize that those events that happen out there get interpreted by you in ways that are modifiable. So I can fix this. Uh, my approach and outlook are paramount to getting through and enjoying, and I love this, this expression, the last part of me. It's poignant. Uh, more aware of doing some things that were mundane, but very important in my life. This is one of the things that we emphasize in the class, is that the sources of positive experiences need not be these earth-shattering positive things. They may be just a nice phone call with your family, or walking down the street and, and, and feeling the sun on your face, or having just positive thoughts about what you might do tomorrow. There are lots and lots of very relatively seemingly minor things that are, that are good for recognizing that it was positive and, and thinking about it and enjoying it and then searching out for more of those kinds of experiences. Um, have you made changes? So I do things with friends more. I'm exercising more. Again, nothing that we talked about, but a, a knock-on effect from, from feeling higher levels of eudaimonic well-being. I took positive steps to control my leg pain. Um, and then what will you take away? The trick is to continue on even with an obstacle. So getting past obstacles. Um, like on a cruise, I'll go on a cruise, right? Take the cruises. On a cruise, I rent a scooter so I can get where I want to go, but I still go. So if you have trouble moving, but you want to go to a town, find a way to do it so that you can get the enjoyment out of that experience. Um, I will pay more attention to my emotions, recognizing what I'm feeling and address it. Maybe just let it go. Again, sort of recognizing the things you want to fight on and the things that you may just be, you might be happier if you let them go. So, to sum up where we are so far. Well-being, I hope you are convinced. Again, I think it's a little bit like preaching to the choir, but well-being is a central component of what it means to be healthy. I hope I've, I've persuaded you to some extent anyway that, that measures of, of diverse measures of well-being, happiness, sense of purpose in your life um, are protective. They help you live longer, they help you avoid illness, or at least have fewer illnesses, less disability over time. But then also that there are these compensatory effects. So in the context of illness, in the context as, as what, like what Julie studies, in the context of financial crises, having high levels of well-being may be, may be protective, may be compensatory. That these things are not just a nicety of life. They're not just sort of, it's nice to feel good, but they're actually critical components of health, as our, particularly as our health begins to decline with age. And then finally, that these things are, are modifiable, that we can promote well-being. Um, and I want to close with, well, a couple of things, but the first thing I want to close with is the focus of what I've been telling you so far has been very much at the individual level, right? We can, we can bring people into things like, like Lighten Up, there are other sort of well-being based interventions, and we can target you as an individual and help you to feel more positive and, and in, get more enjoyment out of the positive experiences in your life. But I think there are other things that we can do as a society to increase the chances for older adults to have these kinds of positive experiences. So I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about that. There are some things that are going on right now that do, I think, offer um, potential roadmaps for these kinds of things. So Experience Core, for example, is a uh, study that's been going on for a while now in Baltimore um, and a number of other sites, I believe. And this is high intensity engagement, about 15 hours a week, of older adults going into schools to help out with a variety of different kinds of things. And the results of this, this, I mean, this is high intensity. 15 hours a week is a lot to ask of people. But the results have been really impressive. So reduced disability, reduced rates of depression. People are being more physically active even when they're not here. And then the, the Experience Core project has gotten 
uh, measures of brain volume, one of the things that happens with aging, unfortunately, is that we tend to lose volume in a lot of different structures. And what they're showing is maintenance, preservation of brain volume in key structures like the hippocampus, which is implicated in memory and memory decline, and the cortex, which is involved in all kinds of planning, interpretation of events, and so on. So we see preservation of brain volume in those areas through these kinds of high-intensity high engagement experiences. That's one example. There are others. Um, there are couple, examples from other countries where, for example, in nursing homes, a, nursing, a nursery school also exists on the premises, and kids show up for a few hours a day and can interact with older adults. And at least anecdotally, this looks like a very positive experience for the people that engage. Um, in a couple of different places now. So in Cleveland, um, there's this living situation where students at the Cleveland Conservatory of Music can live in a nursing home rent-free if they give concerts. <laughs> so they'll give a few concerts during the course of the year and uh, the older adults will attend and they live there so the, the residents of the nursing home can get to know the students. And what's interesting is that both sides report very, very positive experiences. The older adults love the music, they love having the younger adults around. The younger students report getting to know the, the older adults and forming very, very strong bonds with them, uh, absolutely unexpectedly. Similar kind of setup in the Netherlands, this has gotten a lot of press, I think, um, where, again, same, similar type of idea. College students are given free room and board to live in a nursing home in exchange for helping out, helping out in the kitchen sitting and talking with residents, um, leading activities, whatever it is. And there are videos on this that you can find on YouTube, which in the most striking thing, not surprisingly, the older adults are, uh, they, they profit from engagement with, with the younger, the students. But what's always sort of surprising to everybody is how much the students get out of it. They really, they say, you know, I came in thinking older adults are basically, uh, I didn't have anything to learn from them. I would be just, it would be dreary work. and discovering that these people have wonderful life experiences and wisdom and wit and charm and, and they respond to those uh, very, very positively. So these are kinds of models of things that we could potentially be doing at a societal level to both give older adults a sense of, of more of a sense to, or opportunities to have a sense of purpose and growth but also to, I mean, give them more opportunities, but also to solve problems like the high cost of college education and board and room and all of that stuff. So there, there are lots of win-win setups in this. I wanna make a note, this is, I'm, I'm stealing a page out of, out of the kind of talks that Carol usually gives, and we've had conversations about this over the years. Um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that uh, well-being is, uh, that we take a sort of Pollyanna-ish view of well-being, that it's all happiness and, and it should never, it's, it's the absence of ill-being, it's the absence of adversity, you should always be shooting to, to be happy all the time. This is not at all what we think of it as, as the, the critical elements of psychological well-being that we think are most, most intimately linked with these positive health outcomes. Rather, um, it is continuing to have a fairly positive outlook and the ability to glean positive experiences in the contexts of, that, of the difficulties that we all face in our lives. It's not ignoring them, it's dealing with them anyway and continuing to have a relatively positive orientation in spite of those and maybe learning from those, those uh, periods of adversity and those challenges. So we think of well-being not as, as isolated from adversity or the opposite adversity, rather it could be the product of adversity, the product of successful adaptation to challenge. Um, and what we really encourage in the Lighten Up program overall is it's not that, that you need to do anything differently, it's just paying more attention to the positive stuff that's happening all the time that we just don't tend to pay attention to and recognizing it and, and getting more out of it, enjoying it more. All right, I said at the beginning that I was going to set Will up as a bit of a foil and I want to close by trying to repair this relationship a little bit. Because <laughs> as I said, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Shakespeare. And you know, he, he, if you know his plays at all, you know that he was an exquisitely keen observer of human behavior and, and the human condition. And the plays that he wrote are, resonate today as much as they ever did back in Elizabethan England. So the first thing I would observe is that if Shakespeare were alive today, he would be writing differently about old age. 
He would. He was a keen observer of, of human beings. And he would characterize old age differently because it's different now. So it's not that he had a particularly pessimistic view. He was just reflecting what he saw. And indeed, even back then, his views of aging evolved as he himself aged. You know, he died at 52, so he wasn't exactly old when he died. But for his time, he was. And his views of aging knew, became more nuanced. Um, it, this, certainly, there were failings and physical disabilities and declines. But he also, in his, many of his characters, there was a, a high degree of poignancy, particularly for characters like King Lear and Falstaff, where they're aware of their failings and they muse on them. And it's a very sympathetic portrayal of aging. So even in his own day, Shakespeare was, was not completely um, ageist, if you will. But I think today, were he writing, he would give us a much more nuanced and per possibly much more optimistic portrayal of old age. So now, it is really up to us to address the prejudices that still exist and to take a page out of Shakespeare's life and rewrite what, what it means to age in current day. Thank you for your attention.